Happy Wednesday and welcome to Mysteries and Mimosas. I'm Max and I'm here with Arya, my awesome, phenomenal co-host. Or maybe I'm the co-host. I don't know. What do you think? No, I think... I We're both know. co-hosts? Yeah. We're each other's co-host. Yeah. Good call. Okay. Well, so today, let's start off by if you enjoy this and if you don't enjoy this, it's okay. Do us a favor, hit the subscribe and the like button, give us five stars. That would uh, help us out immensely. Also, please, I'm actually going to get the website updated for this episode because there's some interesting photos that we need to put on this episode on the site. So www.mysteriesandmimosas.net. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Mysteries and Mimosas Podcast. And we're on YouTube. Yeah, I always forget about YouTube. Yeah, don't forget about YouTube. I like to watch how the subscribers keep increasing. So On YouTube? Yes. Well, yeah, no, I don't even pay attention to YouTube. I just publish it. But one of these days when we make it big, we'll be on YouTube like with our faces. Like yes. Like for real. Video. Not just audio. Right. I'm not ready for that commitment just yet. No, not yet. Okay. We're going to start this episode off today with some trivia. It's from the year 1985. Are you ready? Ooh. I know I said I was going to have your mom on, but let's just wait this out and see how long we can yeah. keep talking about your mom before right? she finally calls us. We'll see her uh, uh, Sunday for Easter, and we'll see if she says anything about it, and then we'll know if she's been listening. Yeah, I'm going to ask her. Well, oh, really? Tell us if uh, Aria won <laughs> triv trivia on uh, Wednesday. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. Anyway. Or she'll like binge listen to them all the way up so that she can oh, say she heard them she all. She does do that on her car trips. Uh -huh. So anyway. Maybe. Okay. So I thought this would be fun for trivia today. As we move along in the trivia questions today, they will get increasingly harder. So remember, the year is 1985. How confident are you this was a year before the birth of Aria? I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not very confident in my trivia skills overall, so overall. I don't really know why you would need to make it increasingly more difficult as the questions go on. I mean, it's... Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, if you're not confident in your trivia abilities, mm -hmm. maybe that's why you lose every week. Maybe it maybe is. Maybe if you had a little bit of self-confidence in trivia, you'd dominate. Well, maybe if you were nicer to me, I would have more confidence in my trivia skills. That's true. <laughs> okay. So, in 1985, who was the President of the United States of America? Ronald Reagan. Boom. Number one, out of the way. Mm -hmm. You got it right. Number two, what... By the way, there's not very many trivia questions. But number two, okay. what top-grossing movie starring Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd... Top the box office in 1985. Back to the Future. That's correct. Back to the Future. I I'm love proud that of you. movie. Yeah. Oh, it's a great movie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quick question. This is not part of the trivia. If you had one movie left to watch and before your death, and you can only choose between Back to the Future or The Karate Kid, what movie are you watching? Oh, Back to the Future. For 100%. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, in 1985, what was the top baby boy name? Hmm, 1985. Baby name for girls. Oh, we'll start oh. there. I oh. said boy, but let's see. Oh, man, I had a boy name. Okay, well, let's do boy names then. What was the top boy name in 1985? Jacob. Ooh, no. Wow. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. I thought you knew it was Michael for like ever. I don't know. Huh. Okay, well... What about the girl name? Ashley. No, but that was like a close number two. <laughs> and and that would have probably been my first favorite guess, but uh, it's actually Jessica. Oh, Jessica. Yep. Jessica. Yeah. Jennifer was probably up there. Yeah. Ashley. Okay. Well, I'm going to only count that as one question instead of two okay. so that you're still winning. Okay. Because you, you need to win. Okay. This one is very difficult, but I have a lot of clues. I think you might get it. So here's the question. In 1985, what famous candy was invented? But before you answer, let's talk about the clues. 
The Perfetti Van Mel Company was looking to add more candies to their inventory. The German branch of this company developed a sticky taffy sandwich between two sheets of rice paper. Are we there yet? When Americans taste, I'm sorry, when American taste testers tried the candy, they didn't like the rice paper. So the company removed the rice paper and shaped the very sticky taffy into a rectangle. Nothing yet? All right, I have a couple of guesses, but okay. if you have more hints, then. They used a special wrapper made of mylar because the taffy stuck to, t- to traditional wrapping materials. Yeah, I think it's, is it a bit of honey? No. Okay, if it's not a bit of honey, is it Carmelo's? It's not. Okay. <laughs> All right, this might, this might help you. The original wrapper was red, but they didn't offer any specific flavor like cherry or strawberry. It was just fruity and red. Is Laffy Taffy? It's not Laffy oh. Taffy. You're getting closer. Oh, now and laters? Today. Mm. Oh, man, I'm so disappointed. Today, the candy is available in over 16 flavors. They have a manufacturer or a manufacturing plant in Erlanger, Kentucky, which oh, was yeah. there since That's, 1979. It's not going to help me. Okay, well, I'll just tell you anyway. <laughs> what does it start <laughs> with? They've been producing candy since 1982 out of that factory. It is a 120,000 square foot plant that's currently employing 200 employees. In December of 2015, an explosion occurred in this factory, causing it to catch fire, but nobody was harmed. I do remember that, but I don't remember what company it was or anything. So the candy starts with an A. Hmm. Let me just ask you this. If you were going through the grocery aisle and you wanted a taffy, fruity candy that begins with an A, what are you grabbing? I'm, I'm probably like so dumb right now, but I don't know what you're Yeah, you're kind of about. acting like an airhead. It was airheads? What do you mean it was Airheads? You never said Airheads. No, that's what I was thinking, though, but that I, I didn't know Airheads were that old. I really thought they were, like, invented in the 90s. I love Airheads. Yeah, Airheads are good. I'm actually surprised that you didn't even give Airheads an opportunity. Every time I'm looking for a snack, if I look in your purse, I can typically find an Airhead in there. That's true. I don't think that's ever happened in the history of us being together that you found an airhead in my purse. I just, I, I don't know. I just kind of feel like what? if I'm looking for a snack, I might be able to just open up that zipper pocket and see that beautiful airhead staring at me. I wish. Ready to get eaten. I, I wish that was the case. You, I mean, you'd never find them. I love them. I would never be just hoarding them in my purse. Here's, here's your assignment. I'm giving you an assignment for next week's episode. I need a mimosa recipe that tastes like an airhead. Ooh, that would be delicious. I'm going to probably have to buy a couple cases of champagne just till you get it right (laughs) for you to go through. Okay, so speaking of mimosa recipes, what do you got for us today? Well, today I have a pineapple upside down mimosa. It has champagne, pineapple juice, birthday cake or vanilla rum, grenadine, maraschino cherries, and sliced pineapple for a garnish. Very delicious, Aria. Very delicious indeed. hmm Okay. So today's case is from Miami, Florida, specifically from Biscayne Bay in Miami, Florida. Have you ever been there? Biscayne yeah. Bay? You mm-hmm. have been? I don't believe I have, but maybe I'll put it on the bucket list. I don't know. Anyway, on April 4th of 1985, a passerby found a woman's torso stuffed inside an army green trash bag. It was wedged between two boulders in the bay. And over a period of several weeks, more body parts began to wash ashore, including a woman's head. The day before her torso was found, local fishermen, I'm presuming in the bay, found the torso of a man who remains unidentified to this day. Wow. So a woman's been identified, but the man never has. Oh, it's so crazy. To learn how this woman was identified, but yes, Hmm. that is true. Okay. For decades, the man and the woman were known as Tommy and Teresa Torso. Okay. What? That's creative. Yeah? Well, I mean, you know, it was policing in the 80s, so. 
Tommy and Teresa Torso. Yeah, okay. that's what they were known as. But in the summer of 2010, everything changed when cold case detective Charles McCauley learned about a horrific tale of murder, violence, and sexual abuse, which led to the identification of the dismembered woman's body. 2010? 2010, 25, about 25 years later. Yeah. How crazy is that? 25 years late, later, they're able to kind of piece this thing together. Wow. Yeah, and it's kind of unexpected how you how we'll figure out how this whole thing came to light. So the body was identified as Nilza Padilla. Nilsa Padilla was born in a small fishing town in Puerto Rico called Cantano. Her parents were alcoholics and often left Nilsa and her siblings to kind of take care of themselves. As Nilsa grew older, she saved money and uh, from working uh, housekeeping jobs and random odd jobs, and she moved to New York. So she hopped on a plane and left Puerto Rico without telling anybody in her family. Oh, she just wow. up and left. Two years after Nilsa's move to New York, her brother received an envelope from Nilsa, which only contained a photograph of Nilsa holding a new baby, who turned out to be her oldest daughter, Bernisa. Oh, wow. So she, I'm curious, if, I guess her family didn't know she left and know where she went, and then all of a sudden this picture shows up with her holding a baby. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. And no note, no letter, no nothing. Just, just the a picture. Just a picture of her and, and um, Bernisa. So as it turns out, after Nilsa moved to New York, she met a man by the name of Miguel Cruz. She had two daughters, presumably with Miguel, and that's where we learned about Bernice as the oldest and Gloria as the youngest at this time. Okay. A short time later, Miguel went to prison, at which point Nilsa left Miguel and met a man by the name of Rafael Guzman. Okay, so Miguel's in prison. She has two daughters and meets Rafael Guzman. But Rafael Guzman was simply an alias for his real name, which was actually Jorge Walter Nunez. And Walter, sorry, Jose, Jorge Walter Nunez was from Peru. So he's Peruvian. Okay. And so I wonder if she knew about this alias or... I don't know if she knew about the alias, but I mean, if she did, don't you think, I mean, dating somebody or seeing somebody, if they're, if they're going by different names, that might be kind of a red flag, wouldn't you think? I mean, for, yeah, for me it would be, but I don't know. But again, know. you know, this is, this is in the 80s, right. 70s and 80s. So. Exactly. And who knows, you know, he could have told her any kind of story too. Like, yeah. well, I mean, who knows if she knew, but if he had told her, he could have made up whatever he wanted her to oh, hear 100%, too. hundred percent. Yeah. So on July 1st of 1967, at the age of 18, Jorge arrived in the United States, and eventually he overstayed his travel visa. Jorge almost immediately established a lifestyle of crime, getting arrested multiple times for theft, um, actually grand larceny, uh, but none of those charges ever stuck. So Jorge and Nilsa, uh, they, they started abusing alcohol and drugs, kind of living the, the party life. Mm. And eventually, Nilsa, Jorge, Bernisa, and Gloria left for Connecticut in a U-Haul. In this U-Haul, Jorge kind of converted it into a like a travel camper. So out of the back of the U-Haul, that's where they were living. They they made it into a camper. Oh wow! In yeah. Connecticut, that's it gets cold there. Yeah, that's living true. In a U-Haul. Yeah. Well, I mean, it gets cold in New York too. Well, yeah, true, but. I don't know if they were living in the U-Haul in New York, but. Well, in the summer of 81, Jorge and Nilsa showed up at Nilsa's cousin's house. Her name is Maggie, by the way. She lived in Connecticut. Oh, so she, so, so they Nilsa had, a destination. had family here yeah. in yeah. the United States. Or exactly. Or in. In Connecticut. In Connecticut. Okay. According to Maggie, Jorge was always drunk. And on one occasion, she witnessed Jorge hit Bernice, causing an injury. Uh, I guess he opened up her head or you know there was some kind of gash major injury mm. or significant I don't know about major but significant injury enough to where Maggie confronted him and and said hey if you do that again I'm going to call the cops mm. well a short time later Nilsa and Jorge took the girls and headed south to Florida and that's when Nilsa gave birth to their her third daughter which was Jorge's daughter Alicia Guzman Padilla okay so now it's the three girls, Jorge, and Nilsa. In Florida, 
okay. in a makeshift camper it's U-Haul. Still in the camper. Okay. Yes. So how does all of this history with this family pertain to the torso and the bodies found in Biscayne Bay? It's interesting that you asked that. I was just going to talk about that. So in 2010, Nilsa's daughter, Gloria, uh, her name now is Gloria Hampton, contacted uh, cold case detective McCauley that we mentioned earlier and told him everything that happened to her mom. In fact, both Gloria and Bernisa provided DNA samples, which confirmed Nilsa's identity, but the unidentified man, he still hasn't been identified. Okay. So um, according to Bernisa and Gloria, in the spring of 1985, Bernisa told her mom that she was being sexually abused by Jorge. So here, here's what Jorge would do. He would actually isolate Bernisa from Nilsa to molest her. So he would, you know, have to go run errands or, you know, go get beer or whatever the, whatever the case is. He would take Bernisa with him to get her isolated from Nilsa in order to facilitate his crime, which is a pretty common tactic used by sex offenders, especially when it's a known victim. You know, they, they isolate, well, they I'm... manipulate, they use all those tactics in order to get them away from the mom and prevent them from saying anything. Well, and especially they're all living in a camper van. There's five people living in a U-Haul. So, I mean, you know, he would ha almost have to remove her from that situation in order to, correct, you know, do what he was doing. Yeah, and so this went on for quite some time, and eventually Bernisa found the courage to say something to her mom. Well, I mean, good on Bernisa, because all too often that doesn't happen, you know, especially in situations like this where it's a known perpetrator, like this is her... I don't know if she saw him as dad or stepdad or, or what that situation was like, but they're all living together. He's always there. It seems Correct, like yeah. that there's not really a chance when she's left alone to have the opportunity to have that conversation with her mom or another adult that she trusts. And I'm sure she was scared. You know, he, oh, he's been yeah, isolating 100%. her this whole time. Who knows what he's been telling her? Like, you know, all too often victims are made to feel like it's their fault that that's happening to them and sex offenders they're manipulative and they do that they they make it seem like oh that this is the your fault that this is happening you know and then they create these secrets between you know Bernisa and her mom and you can't tell her or else you know then you're going to ruin this this whole thing that we have and then I won't be here anymore. You know what I mean? It just can not can provide go, for you anymore. Right, exactly, and it can go on and on to even even threats of violence if she does say something. So who knows what he was telling her, but those are all things that happen in situations like these. So for Bernisa to finally find the courage to say something is commendable. Yeah, and you know, even just to piggyback off what you're saying, even in today's day and age with children victims, you know, child victims of sex assaults, the 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 perpetrators and we're, you know, we're talking like maybe interfamilial or people who maybe strangers, but I mean people who know the victim, which it's, you know, statistics show that it's most of the time it, it is somebody known to the victim. A lot of times, you know, it starts out with power and control stripping all that power and control away from the victim and it carries on even into the court process and that goes i mean not just in sexual offenses i mean that can come in so many come into play in so many different types of crime that power and control thing is huge and victims lose that they lose the power and control when they are victimized and then the criminal justice system that we have often doesn't give them a voice, right? So they lose the power and control to even have any input as to what happens in that process. Exactly. Right? And so you you put, you know, you compound that with this very difficult case of an interfamilial sexual abuse case. I mean, it, it just compounds everything. So yeah, it, that happens in any type of victimization. But I think it's compounded with a sexual abuse case for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have to give some props to Nilsa because although her initial reaction was to kind of um, lash out to Bernisa for saying something, I think uh, Bernisa is quoted as saying that, uh, you know, her mom had struck her 
um, you know, slapped her uh, when she said this. Um, but, you know, that could just be a, an anger reaction and her go-to, you know, reaction when she's upset. So, but the important thing is she, as you would expect, she did confront Jorge about it. So what that tells me is Nilsa believed Bernisa, which is very important when you're a parent confronted with a disclosure of sexual abuse from your child. Yeah, you always take that seriously. You don't just brush it off or call them a liar or, you know, you have to take take that as this is the truth, this is what's happening until you have absolute proof or, you know, something that says otherwise. It's important as a parent to do that, but it's even more important as a, you know, for those people who might be in law enforcement listening to this, if you're, you know, on patrol and you have to handle these yourself or you're the initial first responder that, that has to handle pretty much any case, you know, but sexual assaults in particular, adults and children, it is imperative that you always believe your victim until the evidence tells you not to. Exactly. Yeah. Well, like I said, Nielsa confronted Jorge about the sex abuse, and in front of all three of these girls, Jorge bludgeoned Nielsa to death with a beer bottle. He began striking Gosh. her with a beer bottle. It was inside of a, p- a paper bag. And, you know, Nilsa tried to climb out of the back of the U-Haul, but he was able to, to push her back in, and he finished the job. So he bludgeoned Nilsa to death in front of these girls. My gosh. How? Sorry, but for one, witnessing that, witnessing your mom being beat to death is traumatic well, enough, but that poor woman, it takes a while for somebody to die from by being bludgeoned by a beer bottle. She That was painful for her. Well, and, you know, Bernisa... At this point, best I can tell is Bernice is, you know, the only one that's disclosed sex abuse, at least. I don't know if, if Gloria experienced this as well at this point, but to watch your mother get bludgeoned to death by the person who's been sexually assaulting you right. is, is, I mean, I don't even, I can't even begin to comprehend what a victim would have to go through to overcome this. No, it takes I, yeah. a very strong person. I mean, I, how horrible. That just, that whole the whole thing just solidified for Bernisa that, well, I can't tell anybody ever again because I told somebody and look what happened. He killed my mom because I said something. So right. I'm just going to have to live with this now and deal with it because it's the way it's going to be. There's nobody here to help me. And even if I tell somebody, you know, look how that turns out. Exactly. It just solidifies in her mind again that she has no control or power in that situation and he, he can do whatever he wants. That's terrible. Yeah. Well... Yeah, it is terrible. After killing Nilsa, Jorge dismembered her body and stuffed it into an army green trash bag, just like the one that was found on the beach, right? Mm-hmm. The next day, Jorge headed south towards the Florida Keys. Only a few weeks later, Jorge made the girls cereal for breakfast, but Bernisa wasn't hungry. When Jorge noticed an uneaten bowl of cereal, he asked who didn't finish their breakfast. So as you can imagine... Like you just mentioned, Bernice, Bernisa is now afraid of sure. Jorge because what she what he saw her do to her, her mom. Right. If she wasn't already scared before, now she really is. Right. So fearful of Jorge, she pointed at Alicia because she didn't think Jorge would hit Alicia, but he did. He hit Alicia across the head, causing Alicia to go limp. Jorge then left with her unconscious body, and Alicia was never seen again. Oh, my gosh. So, wow. So he killed their mom and now their sister. Yeah, presumably. I mean, she's never been found, which is oh. what the reason for this case today. That is one of the mysteries. Number one, who is, you know, the mystery is who is the man that was found with Nilsa right. in the bay? Where did, uh, you know, Alicia go? And, you know, where is Jorge? We'll, we'll get to that. But there's there's a lot of mystery here. So... Anyway, it's Bernice's belief that Jorge dumped Alicia's body in a trash can somewhere and just threw her out like a piece of trash. Jeez. So I wonder why she thinks that. Like if she saw him. Or if it's do a suppressed that, memory or... that she might. Right, exactly. Yeah, hmm. So Bernice and, and Gloria endured years of violent physical and sexual abuse at the hands of Jorge and eventually ended up in a housing project in Marathon, Florida. The girls were enrolled in school, and one night, the girls had a friend, like a neighbor friend, over for a sleepover. 
During the sleepover, Jorge climbed on top of this friend. He was drunk. She fought him off. She elbowed him and, and pushed him off. And when she turned on the lights, she saw Jorge with his pants around his ankles on top of the other two girls, Bernice and Gloria. Jeez. She reported this incident to the police. And once Jorge was arrested, Gloria disclosed the abuse to police, but Bernice refused to talk. Probably Wonder because why. Yeah. what we just talked about, exactly. right? So when Jorge was... Um, Arrested, he was charged and convicted for abusing the girls, and he was sentenced to four years. Oh, well, good. At least he was, I mean, four years is not, a, you know, a lot of time. I get that. But at least there was enough evidence Something in happened. the belief, yeah, that he was actually convicted. So, But remember, at this time, nothing was ever, you know, suspected, I guess, by the police because... When he was released, Gloria and Bernisa were already placed in foster care, and they were, they ended up in a, a shelter for children. Mm-hmm. So according to Gloria, she tried to report her mom's murder years earlier, but the complaint was dismissed by some female detective who basically just told Gloria, hey, you know, we're too busy with our cases. We don't have time. So oh, she my was, gosh. Well, you would uh, – I mean, you would think, okay, so these girls report this sexual abuse. He ends up going to jail for it or prison or whatever – Nobody in that whole time was like, hey, where is your mom? Who, you know, who's taking right. care of you? Like, they had to have questioned that because they had to put them in foster care because they're like, oh, well, dad's in jail and there's no mom in the picture. But that didn't, like, click when they're like, oh, wait, yes, our mom's dead. Right. Well, you we know, don't have time to look into that. And, they, and they've, and they you know, reported this to police before and nobody ever took them seriously. Um, and so I don't know, you know, during this time, did, did the girls maybe just say that mom ran away because they were fearful of Jorge because they witnessed what happened to, you know, their mom and Alicia, you know, I don't know where, where mom is or why they didn't, you know, maybe they did question it and they just didn't get the answers they needed and they had nowhere to turn because a lot of times, most of the time DHS, when, when you have to remove a child, they try to place those children with safety plans with parents or, or, you know, maybe another parent or grandparent or, or an aunt or some family. kind of family member yeah. to keep them in that family. Sometimes, though, when there's no family available, they have no choice but to place them in foster care. And so my guess is either they didn't get the information they needed to try to find their mom or they had information to believe that maybe mom ran away or just wasn't in the picture for some reason. And that's why they ended up in foster care before going to, the, you know, the, the child uh, shelter. No, I get that. It just seems like if we know for sure mom's not in the picture, cause the, which we do, because <laughs> dad's in jail, kids are now at a children's shelter. If a kid then says, hey, yeah, our mom was killed by Jorge, that they would be like, oh, maybe we should look into that. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, why? Right. Why did they dismiss that? I don't know. Hmm. Well... You know, thank God for, uh, you know, detective, the cold case detective McCauley, because when, when the, when Gloria came in to report this, he believed her right away. I mean, he started looking into the cold case files. Um, they still had the remains in the, um, probably inside the coroner's office somewhere, but, you know, they had it stored because it's an, it's an unsolved right. murder. And so they took DNA from the girls uh, from Bernice and from Gloria, they ran the test, the DNA tests against the remains. And that's how they were able to determine that, yes, this is in fact Nilsa. But unfortunately, they still, like I said, haven't been able to identify the unknown male. But um, the best I can tell, some research uh, says, uh, some reports state that they were able to determine that the dismemberment was used by, or uh, was caused by the same cutting instrument, the same saw for both bodies. Oh, so he probably killed that man too. I'm curious who it was. I'm curious who it was too. He's Mm -hmm. never been identified, but you know, with, with DNA advancement, hopefully one day they'll be able to do some kind of genetic genealogy with whatever DNA they may have left and try to identify through, you know, family trees Mm -hmm. to find out who this person is. Did Bernisa and Gloria ever, get back in touch with their aunt in Connecticut? They did. They, they uh, started doing some research trying to get a hold of, um, of their family back there. They were able to reconnect with their aunt. 
Um, the unfortunate thing, you know, Jorge was, uh, you know, a warrant was issued for Jorge, but by the time the warrant was issued, um, the police learned that he was deported in 2004 back to Peru. Mm. So not only is Jorge wanted for the murder of Nilsa Padilla, Elisa Guzman Padilla was never heard from or seen again. So, you know, this just begs the question, whatever happened to Jorge? You know, I, I was unable to find a date of birth for him. I, I'm sure it's out there, but best I can tell, Jorge would be in his 70s. There's a very good likely possibility that he's still alive, hmm. maybe in Peru. During the time after he was released, before he was deported, he was reportedly in contact with police up and down the coast of Florida, basically living as a beach bum, homeless, you know, Just doing drugs, doing alcohol. involved in... Shenanigans. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, I think it's very possible. Could he be in the United States? Sure, absolutely, he could be. Mm -hmm. He could have made his way back to the United States. If he is, I'm guessing he's in Florida because I, I feel like this person would never stop giving up trying to find Bernisa and Gloria. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that knowing that now that they're adults, if he doesn't know that they've already gone to the police and that there's a warrant issued for him, I would suspect that both of those girls would probably be in some danger from him. Oh, yeah. If he's still capable, you know, mm -hmm. and physically physically capable enough to hurt them. Well, I mean, yeah, he sounds like a violent person. Obviously, he's killed, from what we know, probably three people just from this case. His his own daughter, his wife, yeah. and then some unidentified man. Well, you know, either he's in, in Florida, up and down the coast, still living on the beach, you know, made it back into the U.S., or he's doing the same thing in Peru. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just being homeless, maybe out in the jungle somewhere. Uh, I did read an article. I think the last time he renewed his ID in Peru was in 2010. Hmm. He hasn't done anything since, but I'll be honest with you. That really doesn't mean anything to me because if you're that much of, I'm sorry, if you're that much of a degenerate that you're not getting a job, mm -hmm. you know, you're living basically homeless inside of a U-Haul most of your life, you're sexually abusing children you murder their mom and their little sister. What makes anybody think that this person is going to go out and renew his ID after, right. <laughs> you know, only doing it in 2010? Yeah. And who knows how long do Peru Peruvian IDs last? Right. I don't know. And he the, he probably only renewed it or obtained it in 2010 cuz he needed it to gain something for himself, some benefit for I himself. Would, yeah, you're probably spot on with that. I, You know, I, he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that just shows up in Peru and he's like, well, I, get I think ID. I'm going to plug in. I'm going to get an ID because I'm gonna it's the right thing to do. I'm going to get a job and I'm going to, yeah, no. No. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's today's case. And I know it's a shortened version. There's a, a very phenomenal article out there where we got most of our source material from. Um, of course, we get source material from various places, news articles. The Charlie Project is a very good source material for this case. Um, the Miami New Times is, has the article that has a lot of information, including interviews with Gloria and Bernice, uh, some quoted stuff, w and from the detective. But if you have any information about Jorge Walter Nunez, you like how I said that? Mm -hmm. If you have any information about him or his whereabouts, or any other information about the disappearance of Alicia Guzman Padilla, please contact the Miami-Dade Police Department at 305-471-2334. And remember, Jorge Nunez is known to go by the name of Rafael Guzman. Right, I forgot he had an alias. He has an alias and a lot of other issues, apparently. Yeah. Jeez, what a sad story that was. This yeah, when I was when I was reading through this, I just couldn't help but think like this is a this is like a Hollywood story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not very often that something so sinister and you know, violent and tragic happens for such a long length of time. I mean, it happens obviously. You know, mm -hmm. we we see these cases, you know, you look at true crime cases you know, documentaries and things, and we know that it happens. But in reality, it, they're, they're a rare type of case to investigate. 
Yeah. Most of the time when you, when we get cases of, you know, sexual abuse or, you know, I don't know, domestic violence or assaults. I mean, they're, they're not to this extreme, you know, level. Yeah. I mean, just those poor girls. I mean, they just had such a horrible life. I mean, they're traveling around the country in a modified U-Haul that, I mean, that's where they're living, right? They're poor. They don't ha- have a lot of food. No, in, not fact, being... in fact, they don't have enough food to survive that, you know, one of the articles I read, and it might've been the one from Miami that said that there were times when these girls, the only time they would eat is if they found crab or shrimp on the beach and they would be, they would have to scavenge for food. And if they didn't find those things, they wouldn't eat. Jeez. And on top of that, you know, they're being abused physically and sexually. And they watch their mom get bludgeoned to death. They watch their little sister get smacked in the in the head and go limp when we assume is deceased as well. Like, how horrible. I. That's just heartbreaking. Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. And just to to try to comprehend what a victim must feel and experience in the amount of therapy and the amount of nightmares and the amount of just emotion, the emotional toll that it takes on a person. Um, you know, I, I don't think that, that any regular person that hasn't experienced anything like this would ever understand or fathom what these girls have gone no, through. No, absolutely not. So just sitting here listening to this, I feel awful, right? And so imagine living through that as a child. Like, how do you, I know everybody says, you know, oh, kids are so resilient. And, but I mean, how do you find a path forward from something so devastating and horrible? That's, right. I mean, it, it has to take strength that I know I don't have to, to be able to do that. These girls did show incredible strength. I mean, not only did Bernice tell her mom, which stopped, you know, pres- would have stopped the abuse if if things had played out differently, mm-hmm. you know, Jorge didn't kill her, uh, Nilsa. You, but she, she also had the courage eventually with Gloria to come forward several times to police and try to say, hey, this is real, this happened, my mm-hmm. mom was murdered. Yeah, and they didn't give up after being told, oh, well, no, nah, either we don't have time or no, we don't believe that or whatever. They kept coming back and eventually, you know, found some sort of justice for their mom. I mean, there's an arrest warrant out for him. I can't say that that's justice, but at at least they were, you know, they they didn't give up trying. Yeah, right, exactly. And so, you know, cheers to these two girls because... Good thing they had each other, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because could you imagine having to experience all of that type of abuse and neglect alone? No. No. I couldn't either. So, well, anyway, not to be Debbie Downer, I do want to end on a positive note. Um, Rate the show. Give us five stars if you think we're worthy. Aria, as I mentioned, she's about one and a half stars at this point. Uh, That leaves, God, I'm bad at math. Is that three and a half for me? I'm not helping you. I'm kidding. (laughs) Three and a half for me, one and a half for Aria. Or if you want, you could just give all five stars to Aria. That's what people should do. That's what people should do. A hundred percent. I know. I'm very, very, um, I like to tease you. I'm, yeah, I know. I'm people, not genuinely mean. No, pe- but people that don't know you, they probably listen and they think, geez, this guy's such a jerk to her. I don't but think anybody thinks that no, I'm a jerk to they you. They probably do. Like if I was on the outside listening in, I'd be like, wow. Uh, that's enough. Stop talking. <laughs> See? See? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they don't know you. They don't know know us personally and know that that's all. I mean, we just have this banter all the time in real life. Real life is <laughs> is more fun it's than even podcast. Better, life. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know. And here's the thing: I want to give everybody a sneak peek. I think that um, you know we've been tossing around this idea for a while now. I don't know anything about podcasting, as you can tell. I mean, I think things are getting better. I do feel more comfortable talking about these things. I I know that I have a lot to offer. I know you have a lot to offer. But I don't know anything about Patreon. Somebody told me about Patreon, and one of these days, I don't know when, maybe next week, maybe next year, we'll start a Patreon, and and in that Patreon, the idea is we're going to talk about my own cases, change the names, 
So I can actually tell you cases from a firsthand experience of what I've done. And you can kind of get to know the investigations from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. I don't know. I'd love to hear the feedback on this if you have any uh, suggestions on that. The Patreon would be for cases that you've worked personally. Yeah, that have resolution. Solved and have resolution. And then we save the missing persons for just the regular podcast because it's about bringing awareness to those. 100%. But, you know, uh, if you have anything, any episode suggestions, I would love to hear them. Please reach out to us at mysteriesandmimosas at gmail.com or mysteriesandmimosas.net, our website. Man, I'm going to give you all kinds of options. Instagram, mm-hmm. Facebook, Discord, YouTube, YouTube, snail mail. Just kidding. <laughs> Nobody uses snail mail anymore. No. Your mom probably does. <laughs> she Actually, probably she does. Did. She sends me, she's cute. She always sends me money on my birthday in the form yeah. of a check yeah. with a happy birthday memo. No, a card. Always. Yeah, no, I'm saying on the, on oh, the check, on the check. she writes a little memo. Oh. Not She doesn't give me a memo random <laughs> of happy birthday <laughs> to Max. <laughs> Reference birthday no. from Aria's mom. It is your birthday. It is your birthday. Make it a good one. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not a memorandum of birthday. It is a, in the memo line on the check, she always says happy birthday. Mm-hmm. And I look forward to it every year. It's the best birthday present I can ever get. <laughs> okay. What? Nothing. Are you jealous? No, I get one too. No, are you jealous that I picked her birthday check over anything that you give me? No. Like literally anything. I, don't really I look think... forward to your mom's birthday card more than anything all year. Wow. I Well, I mean, I don't really buy you birthday gifts. That's true. So we yeah, don't really do that. Enough. No, we just... Don't do that because when we need something or want something, we just buy it. That's true. Okay. Well, <laughs> if we can afford it. Right. Well, yeah. Okay. So thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you for supporting Aria in her endless endeavors to try to win at trivia every week. One of these days, I am I'm going to get all of them Man, right. I really thought this week was the week. I'm so sad. I'm going to go to bed so sad. So anyway... I'm actually wanting to end on a positive note, but now you reminded me how terrible you were at trivia. I have to end on a sad note. So with that... Cheers. Cheers.